Welcome everyone, in this video we are going to derive a formula that we can use while analyzing refraction in spherical surfaces. The picture is as follows. We have a spherical refractive surface, we have a line that passes through it, and I am going to use mirror term terminology and call it the principal axis. We will have a center of curvature, the imaginary center, if we were to have a complete sphere. It is the center of the sphere, the imaginary sphere. Then, of course, we will have a length R then, which is the radius, the radius of curvature, it is called sometimes. And we have a light beam. It is going to be coming in such a manner. And it is going to be refracted, refracted. What does it mean? It will be, it means that the direction of the motion will change. So it would have traveled in this direction, but since there is refraction, its motion will change direction. So it will be perhaps like this. All right. And now I will also define two more distances. We will have this distance called A. This is the distance between the point where the coming ray intersects the principal axis and the refractive surface and the other length is called B. It is the point where the ray passes through the principal axis one more time and the uh, and between the refractive surface. So distance here between here and here, okay? And if I draw a normal line, which is drawn from the center of curvature to the specific point that we are interested in, and I don't want to call this M. Why would I call it M? This is the center of curvature. Let's call it C. So I call the center of curvature C. Excuse me for calling it M. It doesn't matter about... Let's call it C. So we will have the angle of incident like this. This is I because it is the angle between the normal line and the incoming ray. And the angle of refraction is going to be R. The angle between the normal line and the refracted light. So we will also have, oh, by the way, we will have N1 and N2 values. N1 is the refractive index of the outside of the surface and n2 is the refractive index of the inside the side that uh, that is inside of the imaginary sphere so what i want to do is i want to relate n1 n2 a b and the radius the capital r how can i do that i want a general formula well to make our derivation we need to define a couple more angles so i want to define them we will define this one as alpha this one is Theta, let's call it. Oops, that's not looking good. We will have theta, and this one is going to be beta. So, what we can do now? Well, we can say, look, we can say, I is equal to alpha plus theta. How do I know that? I know it because this part, this one in blue, is going to be 180 degrees minus alpha minus theta. So if I add this part, I as well to it, I should get 180 degrees. So it is something like this. Let me draw it actually. We have perhaps something, oops, that's not very nice. We have a triangle like this. This is alpha, this is theta. Then the supplementary angle of the other remaining angle is going to be alpha plus theta. You can convince yourself because this is 180 degrees minus alpha minus theta. This is a geometry side note. This isn't very important. I mean, it is important, but I hope it is clear to you. And then similarly, we can express theta as well. And this is I. What? Why did I do it like that? I don't know. So let's change it. This is I. Let's do a similar thing for theta. For theta, I can say it is going to be using the same logic, R plus beta. And if I solve for R in this equation, I am going to get R is equal to theta minus beta. Now, this is great, but I want to define a height. I am going to define this height between the principal axis and the point where the light touches the refractive surface, h. And now, if I ask the question, what is tangent of alpha, you will tell me it is opposite divided by adjacent. 
So it is going to be H over A, if you look at this triangle. And you can also look at perhaps, and oh, don't, oh yeah, wait. You can also look at tangent of theta, for example. What is tangent of, te tangent of theta? Well, tangent of theta is, if you look at this triangle this time, it is going to be opposite divided by adjacent H over R. And finally, what is tangent of beta? Tangent of beta is going to be, if you look at this triangle, that triangle, it is going to be H over B. And if I use both of these, uh, both, I mean, these three of them to solve for H, I am going to get that H is equal to A times tangent of alpha. And from the below, I get H is equal to R times tangent of alpha. And the other one tells me that H is equal to B times tangent of alpha. Great. Now, I will use what is called a paraxial approximation. A paraxial approximation means that we assume I, theta, alpha, beta, and R. Basically, all angles that we have defined to be angles that are close to zero. These are small angles. And small angles have the property that their sine of x is approximately equal to x and their, excuse me, and their tangent of x is approximately equal to x. Okay, and you might be wondering where these comes from. For example, the first one is the linear and quadratic approximation of sine of x near zero. And I have a video about it. You can find it from the cards right now. And it is also in the description spot. I really recommend, recommend, recommend you to watch it if you don't know these formulas. So using this, this idea, I can say that h is equal to a times alpha. And it is also equal to r times... And what is this mess? Come on. This isn't alpha and this isn't alpha. Right? We had theta and beta here. Very bad. That was a huge mistake. We have tangent of theta and tangent of beta. Excuse me for that. We have r times theta is equal to then. We have b times beta. Great. Now I can solve for alpha, theta, and beta. And if I do that, I am going to get alpha is equal to, I use this one, h over a. Then theta is equal to, I use the one below, so h over r. And beta, I use the last one, is equal to h over b. Great. But I mean, how does this help us? Well, this helps us because we have a very powerful formula left that we can use. We are going to use Snell's law. Snell's law states that n1 times sine i is equal to n2 times sine r. And you can find the derivation of this video in the cards right now. I have a video about it. It is also in the description part. It is a very, very powerful formula that we will use. So what we can do is for, um, for i, we can substitute... I mean, excuse me. So we have n1. And for sine i, we can substitute r, i. Because we made a paraxial approximation. It is here. Sine of x is approximately equal to x. I substituted that. This is equal to n2. And for sine of r, I similarly write r. Here, I can substitute for i and r as well. We will have n1. What is i? i is here. Alpha plus theta. So we have alpha plus theta is equal to n2. What is r? It is going to be equal to this part. Theta minus beta. Theta minus beta. Great. And notice, I also have formulas for alpha, theta, and beta. They are here. So we can also substitute those in them. And if I do that on the new line, I am going to have n1 times. For alpha, I can write, let's see h over a and then i have a plus sign for theta i can write h over r i close the parentheses is equal to n2 for theta we just had h over r and then a minus sign for beta we're going to have h over b as you can see it is here we close the parentheses as well so we see a great thing. We see that H cancels. This is great because this means that 
the formula that we are about to derive is independent of the point where the incoming ray touches the refract refractive uh, refractive surface. It is a hard word to say. And now, if I distribute the parentheses, I am going to have n1 over a plus n1 over r is equal to n2 over a minus n2 over b. I want to have these two guys on the same side because they have the same denominator. I can add them. And if I do that, and if I also add this part to both sides, I am going to have n1 over a plus n2 over b is equal to n2 minus, right? It changes sign because we added, we subtracted it from both sides, divide by r. And this is the formula that we were hoping to find. This explains the refraction case for spherical surfaces. And notice that this only works for paraxial angles. This works for small angles. And in a lot of real life applications, the angles that you work with are small angles, so no worries. And I also want to emphasize another thing. I want you to understand that the minus sign here, I mean, it could have been N1 minus N2 as well, right? How do I decide which one is which? Well, N2 is defined as, <coughs> excuse me, N2 is defined as the one that is inside of the imaginary, imaginary sphere. And N2 is outside. So N1 is, I mean, N1 is outside. N1 is minus and N2 is plus. So you can always remember this difference, which way it is. N1 minus N2, N2 or N2 minus N1. It is N2 minus N1 in this case, but it could have been different. So you subtract the one that is outside from the one that is inside. Anyways, I hope this video was helpful. If you have any questions, please write them in the comment section. I hope to see you in another video. Until then, take care.